job. Since when were you so smart? Come on, faster. Why? No one's chasing me. I'm chasing you. Can't do this, Pete. I'm not like you. I'm nothing. Just let me be nothing. What are you talking about? I can't make a track team. I don't even know why you yes, want you me can. to. Yes, you can. If you can take it, you can make it. What? If you can take it, you can make it. All right, you train, you fight way harder than those other guys, and you win. You get out from under them. Or you keep going the way you're going, and you end up as a bum in the streets. You could do this, Lou. Just got to believe you can. I don't believe. I do. The Torrance Tornado smoked the mile in 4 minutes, 21.3 seconds. Zamborini is now officially the fastest high school runner in American history. Folks, this kid is on his way to the Olympics. Why would I come? You're not going to win. Sure, I know that. It's all right. Four years' time, next Olympics, that's when I show him. This is just the tryouts for me. Tokyo. Tokyo. Smart kid. Take care of yourself, all right? Mm-hmm. Come here. Thanks, Pete. For everything. worth a lifetime of glory. Remember that. All right, so we would have about a two minute and 15 second video if you want to just sit here. It's from uh, the movie Unbroken. If you've never seen the movie Unbroken, Louis Zamperini's uh, uh, his life story. He was a uh, he was an Olympic runner, 1936. He was a World War II vet in the Pacific arena. Uh, he was a prisoner of war for for several years. And um, anyway, his story. Uh, uh, Angelina Jolie. Uh, she did a she directed a movie about his life in. It came out in 2014. It's interesting. He died at the age of, I believe, 97. Uh, he died in 2014, July 2nd. And um, she said she was able to show him the rough cut of the movie before he passed away. And so uh, it was released later that year, I think Christmas time. And um, the Billy Graham Association came in afterwards because they told the rest of the story. The rest of the story when he came home from war and and the things he had to deal with there. But eventually visiting a Billy Graham crusade, eventually coming to Christ as his Savior, and uh, understanding what Christ had done for him. And um, in fact, one of the last things he did, he carried an uh, Olympic torch for America for a, you know, when they passed that torch. <clears throat> and the clip was, was this. He never saw himself as a runner. He didn't even know if he could make his high school track team. He did not believe in himself. And then it switches very quickly to he's one of the best high school track runners in, in America, and he's going to the Olympics. And as he goes to the Olympics, his brother Pete tells him, he says, Louis, remember that a moment of pain is worth a lifetime of glory. A moment of pain is, is worth a lifetime of glory. And so that was the clip. And you would like that, and you would say, Ray, have Rod got us a clip and all. And then I would come up here, and I'll tell you about some conversations I've had over the, the last, actually, few weeks and months. And it, it was really striking to me that one of these conversations happened with a retired 
a retired pastor. And we were talking about the state that the world is in, the condition that the world is in. And we were talking about everything from, from politics to what's going on in the Olympics to it just, just everything looks messed up. It's, it's you know, it's, it's like you, instead of looking at a painting of Rembrandt and you can kind of tell who it is, you're looking at modern art and you're just trying to make sense out of it. You're trying to make connections that you can't, can't make. And this friend of mine was telling me about his, his wife and we were, we were talking about how it's just, it just feels like the weight is on you. Nothing makes sense. And, and there's a hope that somehow we would get back to normal. But what, what's normal? Hopefully I'll make a comment about what's normal here and, uh, once we get to the, the passage. But, you know, it's, it's just the weight. And, and me and my friend, we disagree theologically on, on some things. We love each other. We just, we just disagree on some things. And I began speaking to him in, from this perspective. I began speaking to him from, from my theological perspective. And I remembered a sermon that I did back uh, it's my, maybe a couple of years ago now in Second Peter. And how Peter said the, the Old Testament prophets would marvel to see what he was able to see. The fact that if, if they could switch places, they would, they would marvel. And I told my friend, I said, look, where you and I are sitting and standing is a place of wonder. Fear should not grip our hearts. Wonder and amazement should fill our hearts. Because we get to see something that for 1,900 years, believers hadn't been able to see. We get to see what God is doing. And look, if this world is not our home would you really want it to feel normal? When I say things aren't normal, I mean, I don't know if you saw it, but six Christians were arrested in France for driving a bus around with a sign saying Christians are being persecuted. And that was offensive speech. Speech now is, is offensive. In fact, I saw an interview earlier this week with some British authorities saying they're going to search social media. And if you say something that's inciting on social media, they're going to come and arrest you. They have ways of making you conform. Well, what's offensive? Well, it's kind of in the eye of the beholder, isn't it? You know, well, what would be deemed as... They set themselves up as the authority and the arbiters of what is right and wrong... And the problem is what they said was right and wrong 10 years ago is no longer right and wrong. And what they say is right and wrong today, if history shows us anything, it won't be wrong tomorrow. And so all of these, these feelings were just depressing my friend and his wife. And I said, oh, but these are good times. These are good times. These are good times when you are not tempted to rely on anything but God. You're not going to rely on your job. You're not going to rely on your neighbor. There was, there was recently a survey done, I think it was two weeks ago, when they asked people who would go and fight for their country, and I'm talking about America here, and it was pitiful. There's nothing nothing to believe in. There's nothing to stand for. There's nothing to, to embrace to say, here I take my stand. I can do no other. These values, these ideas that formed Western civilization, these are ones that I would defend even with my life. That doesn't happen anymore. And so part of my job is to come in and encourage you to give you a perspective, I felt like I was doing my job to my past friend. And look, he would have done the same to me. When I said the things I said to him, he remembered a passage of Scripture in Jeremiah that he had preached 10 years earlier. And he was talking about what, a, what an incredible blessing is. That's the one thing about being a pastor. It's amazing how many times people that sit under your ministry can share something with you that encourages you. And you say, where did you learn that? Oh, from you? Oh, really? Really? Because there's times we just, we just need to be reminded. So I started searching Scripture and, and looking in it, and I wanted to land in Second Peter, not for a series, but just for a bit of encouragement. 
an encouragement to be faithful, an encouragement that tells us that a moment of pain, a moment of anxiety, a moment of conflict is worth an eternity with Jesus. So, in the passage that Raquel read this morning, Paul is writing, it's his last letter. Here in the next few days, or actually it's probably in the neighborhood of a, of a month or so, he's going to die a martyr's death because of his faith in Jesus Christ. And he writes his understudy, Timothy. Timothy is probably the pastor at Ephesus, and he writes him, and he wants him to come to him. And, and this letter is different because this letter is done from a dark dungeon. This letter is done from a place of death. And as Paul is writing and as he's reflecting, he's thinking, okay, this matters. These ideas matter. And Paul looks and he sees a number of people. In fact, he will say in verse 15 of chapter 1, he'll say, uh, may the Lord show mercy to... No, verse 15. You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me. And he'll even name names. People that thought it was a really good idea to follow Paul and his teachings for a while. But then after a while, uh, there's just something else to run after. And he says, Peter, everyone is... I mean, Timothy, everyone has deserted me. And so what will Paul write Timothy? What will he say to him to encourage him to remain faithful? And I think he'll give three pictures. He'll plant three images in his mind to help him remain faithful. I picked up in verse 13 of chapter 1 where he says, What you heard from me keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ. Guard the good deposit. In other words, this deposit that he has, these ideas, these words that he had learned from Paul, it's not something that should just be placed somewhere and left alone. It should be guarded. Why? Because the enemy is after to snatch it, to steal it. If you don't prize it, someone else does prize it, but for the wrong reason. And so he says he's going to catch it. He's going to take and snatch it while you're not looking. So guard it. This is precious. Keep these ideas. Keep these ideas close to you. <clears throat> and he says, guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. You're going to need the help of the Holy Spirit, the song that was just sung, to help guard these ideas, these teachings. And so is it any wonder that people believe ideas, embrace ideas, that would be antithetical to the way a normal, I'll use that word again, society works and, and live, lives out its ideas. There are times I sit in my chair and I, and I ask myself, I say, can't people just leave other people alone? Can't people just be content? A friend of mine showed me some video of people going through their neighborhood and trying to get into cars and stealing cars or whatever was in there. And I just said, can't people just keep their hands to themselves? But that's not the way society works anymore. And so Paul will tell Timothy in chapter 2, he, he, I'm skipping a little part, but, but in chapter 2 he says this, because in chapter 1 he talks about suffering. And in chapter 2 he says, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And I just, just want to make a statement real, real quick here. Be strong in the grace. You, you think about that, growing in the grace. And I'm a, I think back how many times I'm, I'll use the technical term, poo-pooed, from, from believing so much in grace. You know, I see people pastors pulpits that are not strong in the grace it's like they're strong in their religion they're strong in their works but they're not strong in the grace of jesus christ and the things he says here and the things first chapter 2 verse 2 of second timothy and the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and it's it's interesting here that he talks about these are things that he's going to say in the midst of an audience you know um there are people that say, oh, I've got secret knowledge. 
I've got something. Because Timothy was a, an understudy of Paul, maybe Paul taught him some deep things, but that's not what Paul's saying here. Paul's saying, you were there. You were there at those different places I spoke. You always heard my presentation about what Christ had done in my life. You were there, and you witnessed it just like them. He said, those things that you heard, and he's talking about how this message is passed on. He says, and the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men. You think about that word entrust. If I entrust something to you, what do I have? I have an expectation. I have an expectation. Because what I'm entrusting you with is something that's precious. I, I wouldn't entrust something to just anybody. If I'm entrusting you with something, it, it's, it's because it's precious and it matters. And you realize if you're receiving that, that you're receiving something that's precious. And so I'm not just loaning you something. I'm not just giving you, I'm entrusting you with this. I think about my, my uncle who recently passed away. And the struggle, he didn't, you know, who was he going to leave his things to? Who was he going to entrust them to? And I was telling somebody, you know, I think my uncle, because I, I used to live with him when I was, when I was a teenager for, for three years, almost four years. And I think he knew, have, have you ever seen somebody when they get some money, they go out, I mean, it doesn't have to be a lot of money. It can be like $500. It can be $500 is a lot of money, but it's not like $5 million. But they go out and they just, they just go crazy and they're broke like in three months. And I, I've been talking about as soon as we get this will and, and, and all of this thing worked out, you know, I'm thinking, you know, I might, I might get a, a, a new phone. I might get, you know, maybe we, can, maybe we can afford a new phone. And the reason I say this is because I take his property very seriously. And I said, how would he want me to spend it? What would he want me to do with it? Because he did that very thing. He entrusted me with it. He wants me to carry it forward. He wants me to do with it what he would have done. Act with it the way he would have acted. He goes on. So the things you heard me say in the presence of other witnesses, entrust to reliable men or people, who are, will also be qualified to teach others. So he says, Paul's, look at, the, look at the way it's passed down here. Paul is here. He says, Timothy, the things you heard me say to others, those ideas entrust to other people. So we got three people on stage now. He says, who will be able to teach others also? That's the way the message of encouragement, the good news, the gospel of Christ is passed on. It's passed on from one person to another person to another person to another person. And why wouldn't it be? It's good news. It's good news. It's, a, it, it's God has done something. He stepped into this realm and he's done something. And he's acted on our behalf. So why wouldn't we share that with someone? And then he says this, endure hardship with us. And he gives his first picture here as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. So the first image he uses is that of a soldier. Um, you know, to, to be a soldier is to be put into a, 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 a different, a, how, would I, how would I say this, a, a special community. And, and it's very difficult to in fact, it's impossible to break into this community. Our founding fathers knew that. Our president is the commander in chief, but he's civilian. And he is over the, the armed forces. And so, but this, dare I say, band of brothers, these, this soldier, he says, endure hardship as a, as a good soldier. And why does a good soldier do that? He can do it for the other soldiers. But he, he, he does it to please his commander. There's even some talk, and it's going to be, you're going to hear more about it over the next couple of weeks, of, of stolen valor. Valor that, that people claim to do something, claim to have a part, to play a part, and who have not earned the right to, to be either in that group 
or with that special group of soldiers, that band of brothers. But he says this, that a, a soldier's different from other people. A soldier's different from normal. A soldier looks different from the uniform they wear, from the actions they take. They always say, I'm trying to please the commander who enlisted me, as it were. But they're different from normal. I think believers, to a great degree, should be different from normal. I have post-it notes in my, in my office with sermon ideas, different things that happen. And um, about six months ago, I was talking to a friend, and <clears throat> we were talking about different things and, and cars and, and just different things like that. And this person told me that they had a, a family member that had a $1,000 a month car payment. And, and, and I went... Well, what, wait, you don't mean that. You know. No, $1,000 a month car payment. Now, it, it's all relative, right? I mean, it's all a perspective. Uh, you know, if you make $5 million a year, $1,000 a month car payment, well, really, even then, you shouldn't have a, a car payment of $1,000 a month. But, but I, the person could tell I was shocked, and they said, oh, oh, no, $1,000 a month car payment is normal. I said, Normal? That's normal? Well, <clears throat> I guess I'm not normal. I'm not normal. Why, why would a person do that? And when you start thinking about it, a person does that. Why would a person do that? Why would a person, especially, let's say somebody that makes $100,000 a year. Let's just use that. That's a big number. Why would they have a $1,000 a month car payment? Because I need transportation. No, if you got a $1,000 a month car payment, you don't need transportation. What you need is an identity. You need, you, need an you need something that will communicate to other people something you are that you can't communicate yourself. A soldier doesn't need that. A soldier knows his identity. A soldier knows who he is, and he knows why he does what he does. And this is the other thing, and this runs through all three of these. A soldier's reward for being a soldier is later. <clears throat> It's after he's gone to war. It's after he's put himself out there that he's able to see in the lives of other people what he's done. They might not see it, but he knows. He knows how he stood in the gap. He knows how he did the difficult thing, the hard thing for the benefit of others or of another. He knows how he stood and how he pleased his commander. The Apostle Paul would tell Timothy, think of that soldier. When you walk by and you see that soldier, think of that soldier. Endure hardship. Be faithful by thinking about a soldier. Be like that. But be like that for Christ. And then he goes on and he's going to use another image here. He says <clears throat> uh, in, verse, in verse 5, similarly or likewise, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. And so he uses the perspective of an athlete and how he trains and how he's competing to the rules. Paul will say in Corinthians that he does it to win a crown. By the way, the, I read an article and I had it up here. It's with the video clip, by the way. Uh... Some people are noticing that their medals that they're winning at the Paris Olympics, that they're starting to tarnish already. Not even a week after they won them, they're starting to tarnish. You think about an athlete. When, when a, what an athlete does, an athlete is making a decision. An athlete is doing a cost-benefit analysis. An athlete is not just going out and doing what everybody else is doing because he's got his eye on the prize of what he wants to do, how he wants to compete. And all that energy and all that effort that he puts in, all those late hours, all those long days when he doesn't do what normal is doing, he really doesn't know if it's going to pay off yet, does he? Because he goes by the rules and he does it with a chance to win. The benefit comes later. And Paul is saying, hey, for, for the soldier, the benefit comes later. For the athlete, the benefit comes later. Because a moment of pain, 
a moment of discomfort, a moment of anxiety is worth a lifetime of glory. And so that's why he says, when you see that athlete, Timothy, remember that. Remember that and be faithful. Stay faithful to what I've entrusted you with. And then he says in verse 6, the hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. You know, if we had these three, three people up here, the soldier, the athlete, and the farmer, and we, and we just played, you know, mix them up, kind of, and, and, and you open, you say, oh, yeah, he's a soldier. Oh, yeah, yeah he's, he's an athlete. Oh, yeah, he's a farmer. What would the farmer look like? He would have sun, sunburn. His skin would be kind of like leather. His hands would be rough. A farmer plants and grows and tills the soil and watches over everything, but he doesn't get the benefit of that right away. I was trying to think of an illustration. What, what would Paul not use in this case? Probably a fisherman, you know. For, for me, give me a rod, go out there, boom, caught a fish, immediate. The effort is paid back immediately, but it's not going to be that way with the soldier, with the athlete, or with the farmer. The farmer's going to plant, and the farmer's going to have to wait. But boy, at the end of that waiting, not only the farmer, but other people receive the benefit because all of the pain, all of the anxiety, all of the frustration, all of the things that don't go right, projectors and otherwise, all of those things, the reward of that is down the line. And Timothy, be encouraged. Be encouraged and be faithful. Because, because what you're wanting to do right now, and the temptation for us right now, is to make the world okay and normal for us to live in. And so we're not, we don't have the anxiety. And for it to be okay, but he said, no, that's not the way it works. It's what's coming later. It's what's coming later for the soldier, for the athlete, for the farmer. And then he says this, and he makes this statement, and it's like a punch. He says, reflect on what I'm saying. For the Lord will give you insight into all of this. He said, keep thinking about the soldier. Keep thinking about the athlete. Keep thinking about the farmer. Reflect on it. See yourself in their, in their shoes and how that draws parallel to what you're entrusted with with the gospel. And then he goes on. Remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, descended from da David. This is my gospel. And by the way, that, that is right there the whole ball game is whether Jesus was raised from the dead. I mean, we can do a lot of different practices. We can follow a lot of good advice. But if Jesus Christ was not raised from the dead, we are the most foolish people in all the world. But if Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, then it's game on. And the difference, it, it's made all the difference. So he says, remember that. And he says, this is the gospel for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. I'm bound here in this prison, but God's word is moving out. And he says, therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So he says, I'm going through what I'm going through because it matters. I'm doing what I'm doing now. I've done what I've done because something is happening in the future. And then he does this. Then there's a, there's a hymn. And people had their hymnals out. And there's this song that he is going to say. He says, here is a tr trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. And what he's telling Timothy is to remember that you are so identified with Christ that what is true of Christ is true of you. Since we died with him, since we came to him for salvation, since we came to him for, for his, the free gift that he offers, we will also live with him. Like he lives, we will live. If we endure, and what's he been telling them to do? Endure the hard work. If we endure, we will also reign with him. There's something coming later. There's something coming later for the soldier, for the athlete, for the farmer. There's something coming later for Timothy. 
There's something coming later for us if we endure. Only if we endure. If we don't endure, if we don't endure, we will not reign with Him. We will be with Him. But we will not reign with Him. He says, if we disown Him, he's talking about the other situation. Okay, if, if we disown Him, like, all, like people I've talked about in chapter 1 who forsook me, if we disown Him, He will also disown us. And, and I think a majority, well, I shouldn't say a majority, probably a majority of this see this as, well, if we won't claim Him, then we're not going to have a heavenly home with Him. I don't think that's what he's teaching at all in here. Because he's encouraging him to endure, endure. He's saying if, if we disown him, then we will not reign with him. He'll say, you know, why would I give you a position, a prestigious position, if you denied me? But if we endure, there's a benefit. See, there's something that the athlete, that the farmer and the soldier get that normal doesn't get. He says if we are faithless, he will remain faithful. For he cannot disown himself. And what he's saying here, and where, where he's landing there, here is this. Jesus is going to keep his word to you. In the midst of anxiety, in the midst of trouble, in the midst of questions, in the midst of chaos, Jesus is going to keep his word to you. His promises he's going to keep to you. And so he's telling them, if you see life from this point, if you see life and understand it as an endurance, then you sit back and you go, wow, wow. To think that I will actually have a part in reigning for him. It's not fun a lot of times now. But what's coming, a moment of pain is worth all eternity of glory. And he ends with this in verse 14. Keep reminding them. Timothy as a pastor, keep reminding them. Keep reminding people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. There's so many things we could get distracted by. There's so many things that could capture our hearts and worry us and give us anxiety. And he says, no. A moment of pain is worth a lifetime of glory. A moment of discomfort is worth a lifetime, an eternity with Him. He just encourages us. He encourages us to be faithful, to remain faithful, even when everything around us is screaming to do otherwise. I'm going to have prayer, and then I want you to stay seated right there because I've got five more minutes to this that you don't get to see, that those of you who are, are watching online, okay? But just stay seated. I want to just have prayer to end this part of the service out. Father, help us to understand that there are times when we work and toil and we don't see the effort, the fruit of that effort. Our efforts won't be fully realized until we are with you. Help us to work based on a promise. Help us to endure as a faithful servant of yours. Help us to be that soldier, that athlete, that farmer who understands that a moment of pain and a moment of discour discouragement and discomfort is worth a lifetime of glory. Help us to make decisions even now that we won't regret later instead of not making decisions and later regretting that. Help us understand that everything that we do for you is not given with a prize that will fade or tarnish. Those rewards are put in a special place in heaven waiting for us. Encourage us during these days to remain faithful and to follow you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.